Welcome, Dan Mama. In 1990, Commodore watched on and seethed as consoles started to take over the video game market in the UK and Europe, and eat into the large market share they had gained with the C64 and Amiga. So they came up with a rather hasty solution to this problem, in the form of the slab-like Commodore 64 game system. The C64 was already able to use cartridges and indeed, in the early days of the home micro in North America, many games were actually released in this format. So all the Commodore designers needed to do was move that cartridge slot to the top, remove the keyboard and voila, a cheap and easy solution, but I'll go more into the quirks of that design later on. The C64 GS debuted just in time for Christmas 1990, retailing at £99.99 and came bundled with a four game cartridge including Fiendish Freddy's Big Top of Fun, International Soccer, Klax and Flimbo's Quest, as well as a Cheetah Annihilator joystick. It was supported by plenty of coverage in the European games press of the time, especially in the UK, and Commodore were promising big things. But as we all now know, things never quite turned out how they wanted. Nobody was interested in dropping £100 on a console based on 1982 technology that offered no advantages at all over its many rivals. In fact, existing 8-bit consoles like the Atari 7800, Nintendo NES and Sega Master System could be bought considerably cheaper, and by 1990 people were moving on to 16-bit machines like the Atari ST, Commodore Amiga and Sega Mega Drive anyway. The Commodore 64 game system sold just 20,000 units worldwide and is credited as being one of the worst selling consoles of all time. Its only real boast is that it managed to sell 5,000 more units than the other failed computer based console that arrived on the market at the same time, the Amstrad GX4000. It's also worth noting that it appeared in an Amazing Facts poll once before, where it took an early lead only to lose out to the 3DO in probably the closest viewer poll I've ever had on this channel. So we should probably celebrate the fact it won on its second attempt, with you voting it ahead of the BitCorp GameMate, Emerson Arcadia, Famicom Disk System and the mighty PlayStation 1 for a pretty convincing win. Now we've got that brief bit of history out of the way, it's time to get on with the show as I proudly present 10 amazing Commodore 64 game system facts. Terminator 2, Judgment Day. Only the Commodore 64 comes complete with this game cartridge. I have to start with this one, because it's my favourite story about the C64GS, and one that's just so idiotic you can't believe it's true. And it revolves around the much vaunted Ocean Software movie licence, Terminator 2, Judgment Day. Ocean had very much carved a niche for delivering great movie based games with the likes of Robocop, Platoon and Batman the Movie hitting the top of the charts, so people were very expectant to see what they could do with the hottest film license of 1991. Looking to also cash in on this huge hype, Commodore struck a deal with Ocean to bundle a Terminator 2 cartridge with every C64 GS, replacing the existing multi-game cart. They were sure that this would bring new eyes to the console and improve its fortunes. However, when the final cartridges were delivered to Commodore, a huge flaw was found. Upon boot up, it asked you to press a key to start the game, not the fire button on the joystick, a key on the keyboard, the very thing that was removed from the C64GS to make it a console. This horrendous mistake meant that Commodore had to do a huge U-turn and change all their plans. New packaging for their console had to be scrapped and they had to find a new home for all these Terminator 2 cartridges that they had recently acquired. They ended up making it the pack-in for the C64C computer instead, which proved to be a very successful venture indeed. Good for Commodore I'm sure you're thinking, but they made a lot less profit selling their C64 computers than they did their console and had already spent a lot of money correcting their mistake. Not to mention this took eyes away from their new console and back to their existing computer. Believe it or not, this wasn't the only mistake Ocean made either, because some of the earliest Ocean cartridges were found to have a manufacturing flaw where the connector was placed too far back in the cartridge case. The end result was that the cartridge could not be used with the standard C64 computer. Members of Ocean staff had to manually drill holes in the side of all these cartridges to make them fit. Are 
You'd be excused for not knowing that the C64GS wasn't Commodore's first attempt at creating a console based on their best-selling home computer, because that honour goes to the Commodore Max, which was only ever released in Japan despite being planned for a worldwide release originally. This story starts in 1981 at Commodore Japan, where their chief engineer Yashi Terakura was looking at designing a new games console to compete with the recently released Epoch Cassette Vision and the Atari 2600. He could see these new all-in-one game boxes making a real mark and felt that Commodore had the technology to outdo the competition. He had been closely analysing the design for the upcoming Commodore 64 computer and felt that it was perfect for turning into a console with its 16 colour graphics, hardware sprites and advanced sound chip. He proposed that a low cost version of the C64 could be built with just 4K of memory, a cartridge slot and a simple keyboard to retain compatibility. This new console was originally titled the Commodore Unimax, however, although he felt 4K was enough for a console, remember this was still much larger than its rivals, the software group fought for 8K so it could have a fully bitmap screen. This argument was eventually settled by Jack Trammell himself, deciding that 6KB of memory was a good compromise. But this didn't satisfy the demands of either manufacturing, who wanted to keep costs low, or the software developers, who felt they needed more RAM to create the right games. All this arguing was eventually for nothing though as the final units shipped with just the 4K Terracura originally intended, as well as two joystick ports, a cartridge slot, audio jack and a simple wipe clean membrane keyboard, much like the one found on the rival Magnavox Odyssey 2 and Philips video pack consoles. Although the box for the system would also brand it as a computer, even though it was very much being aimed at the console market and indeed they did make a version of Commodore Basic available for the Max machine. You might have already guessed this, but the Commodore Max was far from a success, with less than 50,000 units being sold, hence why the European launch was put on hold, and as C64 computers started flying off the shelves, the Euro Max was scrapped completely. As I mentioned in the intro, the Commodore 64 GS came to the market with a lot of fanfare, which left many of its prospective customers feeling pretty bemused, as everyone could already see it for what it was, an overpriced and cut down C64 that offered no advantages over the original computer or its many rivals. But you have to remember that Commodore held a large part of the European market at this time and had a lot of sway with magazines of the era because of this. Those aforementioned magazines were quick to publish the many announcements from Commodore which included claims the C64GS was more powerful than both the NES and Master System, in some specific areas maybe, but overall certainly not, and there would be over 100 cartridges available before Christmas, which on paper sounds perfectly reasonable, especially when you consider that there were literally thousands of existing 64 games that could simply be republished in cart form, however when you consider that the 64GS was only released at the beginning of December, this claim is absolutely ludicrous. In reality, only 28 official 64GS branded cartridges were released less than a third of what was promised, although it's worth noting that a lot more were announced, previewed and even in some cases reviewed in magazines of the time. If you want to know more, then the excellent Games That Weren't website has an exhaustive list of these titles along with many magazine scans related to them. I'll link this page in the comments for those who want to check it out and wonder what could have been. It's easy for many of us, especially those of us in Europe, to forget that the original Commodore 64 computer already had a cartridge slot, and indeed had a wide range of cartridge games released for it in the early years. I think this is because these cartridge games were mainly seen in North America, where the standard was very much the norm, as the C64 took over from consoles like the Atari 2600 and Intellivision, not to mention the rival Atari 8-bit computer and Texas Instruments TI-99 also used cartridges too. Over in Europe, the much cheaper cassette tape was very much the dominant format, with discs also proving quite popular with the more serious user. So you can probably see where I'm going with this entry already, because there was already a huge range of cartridges that could be used with the C64 game system, over 200 of them in fact, with a wide range of titles from the likes of Atari Soft, Activision, Broderbund, Epix and Sega. Now this sounds great, doesn't it? An instant catalogue, right? Yes. But there were a few pretty big problems with this, some of which you might have already spotted. 
Firstly, as I mentioned in the intro, most of these cartridge based games were only released in North America, whereas the 64GS console was only released in Europe, so getting hold of them was nigh on impossible. Secondly, there's the keyboard issue again, because as these games were designed with a computer in mind, many of them required key presses for specific functions, and in most cases, there was no way of even knowing if they did require a key press without trying them. Lastly, there was the simple issue of when the games were released, with some coming as early as 1982, they had long since gone out of production. Why Commodore never looked into republishing many of these existing cartridge games is anyone's guess, especially when you see how great some of these games actually were. Despite Commodore being an American company, the Commodore 64 game system was only ever released in Europe. This might seem quite strange when you consider that the Commodore 64 computer was extremely popular in their homeland too, and of course the console market was much bigger in North America, with systems like the Atari 2600 and Nintendo Entertainment System ruling the market. Whilst those of us in Europe were more drawn to home computers like the Sinclair ZX Spectrum and MSX, as well as the 64 of course. Commodore focused much of their marketing on the key markets of the UK, Italy and Germany, with plenty of coverage in the magazines of the time. Despite the initial fanfare for the CC4GS, once the press of the time got their hands on the actual console, the reviews were largely very negative. Their chief criticisms were the repackaging of 8 year old technology with no improvements of any kind, and the high price of the console when compared to its rivals like the Atari 7800, Sega Master System and Nintendo NES, which were all considerably cheaper. Indeed, a full blown 64 computer setup could be bought for around £50 more, which was considerably more attractive than an already home computer focused market. Not to mention the fact that the 16-bit Sega Mega Drive had officially hit the European continent two months prior, offering true arcade action to the customer. When you consider all of these issues, the C64GS was doomed to failure in Europe, and was very much the beginning of the end for Commodore, who would continue to make catastrophic mistakes from here on. One of the biggest problems that Commodore encountered when redesigning the 64 into a console was the single button joystick. In a world where consoles had a minimum of two fire buttons as well as other functions like start, select and pause. Thankfully the existing Atari compatible DB9 controller ports already had the ability to add more signals, so Commodore teamed up with leading UK joystick manufacturer Cheetah to develop a new version of their existing Annihilator joystick. But this was just as lazy as the design of the console itself, as all Cheetah did was change the colour to a fetching shade of beige and make the two fire buttons independent. So the button on the top of the shaft was the regular fire button and the one on the base would act as a second fire button. But that wasn't the last of the issues with the Annihilator, as it was also a pretty rubbish joystick, and the cheapest in Cheetah's range, so it wasn't very well built and broke very easily. Now you might be thinking that you could simply use a controller from say the Sega Mars system or perhaps the Atari 7800 as an alternative. But neither of these were compatible, so poor old 64GS owners were left with no other choice but to put up the Annihilator if they wanted to use both buttons. Thankfully this wasn't too much of an issue in the end, as only a few games would ever make use of the second button, making it a pretty pointless decision in the first place. Are you I've already talked a fair bit about the games library for the CC4GS, mentioning its small range of specific titles as well as ultra cartridge games that could be compatible, but I want to go back to the subject once again for the moment, specifically the official CC4GS labelled games, because one of the few people to produce cartridges for the console was a company rather ironically called the Disc Company. Rather than releasing new games on cartridge like most of the other third party publishers, they followed Commodore's lead by releasing compilation cartridges, loaded with older games adapted to play in ROM format. Despite planning more, they only ever released two of these, called Fun Play and Power Play, which offered up different entertainment options. The first of these, Fun Play, featured three games from those cheeky budget game kings, Codemasters, with Pro Skateboard Simulator, Pro Tennis Simulator, and Fast Food making the final lineup. Now all of these are decent enough games, 
but was that really the best they could do? Codemasters released a lot of really good games for the C64, so two sports games and a dizzy spin-off seemed a bit, um, shall we just say it, shit. Because that's what we're all thinking. The second cartridge, Power Play, was a lot better, featuring three more games, but this time three formerly full price games from Microprose, in the shape of the amazing Stunt Car Racer, the awesome Micropro Soccer, and fan favourite Rick Dangerous. This was a vastly improved lineup, exactly the type of thing the 64GS needed more of. So it's a shame that more publishers didn't go down this route, especially when there was so much quality to choose from. Most of the facts in this video have been something quite insightful or interesting, but right here we have something that is just plain sad. In fact, I was originally going to put this entry last, but I didn't want to finish the video on something so negative and depressing. Now you might remember that at the beginning of this video I mentioned that the Commodore 64 game system only sold a paltry 20,000 units, but what I didn't mention was that that was out of a total production run of 80,000 units. So what happened to all those unsold units then? Did they just end up on the scrap heap? Well, kinda. They were all scrapped but it didn't completely go to waste, as they were taken apart, with the Eternals being reused to build Commodore 64C computers. The console cases were of course just thrown away. You see, one of Commodore's many lazy cost saving measures meant that the C64GS had the same motherboard as the revised C64C computer that was being sold at the same time. Yep, it still even had all the expansion ports present. They were just hidden behind the long plastic casing. And speaking of the ugly slab like design, as you no doubt worked out already, the reuse of that motherboard was the reason it looked like this. In fact, aside from the external aesthetics, the only real change was in the system ROM, which was obviously changed to boot cartridges directly and didn't need to include Commodore Basic or any DOS functions. This is actually the reason why C64GS consoles are now so rare, because all that's out there is what was sold at retail, with no liquidated stock or unsold warehouse inventory to go hunting down, like many other failed consoles. Despite failing with not one, but two Commodore 64 based consoles, the company still couldn't get over the idea, and like gluttons for punishment, they kept coming back for more. A lot of people say that this is what killed the once great company, not putting all their focus into what they were actually good at, building affordable but powerful home computers, and instead getting constantly distracted by more risky vanity projects that were destined to fail. So, after the failure of a second C64 console, Commodore only had one place to go. Yep, you already guessed it, the Amiga. And once again they had two stabs at the cherry, seemingly having learned nothing from their previous mistakes. Ok, so the first one is arguable, given that the Amiga CDTV wasn't really marketed as a console, more a multimedia machine like the Philips CDI, and could be converted into a fully fledged Amiga home computer by adding a keyboard and disk drive to the setup. But it certainly qualifies, given that it was a standalone unit that could plug into your TV and play games. It could be argued that the CDTV was a product before its time, that the multimedia revolution never really took off like people expected, hence why the rival CDI was rebranded as a console, and the PC ended up just filling that part of the market. But it can't be argued that the CDTV was a massive failure, that was far too expensive whilst not really being powerful enough for all the things it needed to do, no video CD capabilities for example and was being marketed at an audience that just didn't exist. The second Amiga based console was of course the CD32, which like the CD4GS was designed to take on the likes of Nintendo, Atari and Sega. In fact its marketing was very much aimed at attacking the latter, as it was released around the same time as Sega's Mega CD add-on. I'm not going to go into the failure of the CD32 too much here, as it already has an amazing facts video of its own, which I'll link down in the description for those who want to watch it. What you do need to know is that this is the product that put the final nail into Commodore's C64GS shaped coffin, a sad end to a once great company. Although Commodore 64 cartridges were phased out in favour of discs and tapes, and the C64GS did absolutely nothing to help revive the format as far as the world's best selling computer was concerned, but they have seen a massive revival in more recent years, 
which is great news for the small group of people out there who own a Commodore console. I'm sure you're all well aware of the vibrant homeboot community for the 64 and the wide range of amazing games that released on an almost weekly basis. If you somehow aren't, then I seriously suggest doing some research. But did you know that many of the best games are actually released on physical cartridges? There are actually two terrific companies that very much lead the way on this, who are both from the UK. Firstly, there's RGCD, headed up by James Monkman, who have been publishing new games for the Commodore 64 since 2006, and also run yearly coding competitions with great prizes that include having your games professionally published. They have since diversified into releasing games for other formats too, including modern systems, but the good old beige bread bin remains their prime focus, and they still offer a wide range of 64 cartridges to buy in their store. Then there is Cytronic, who are run by the absolutely bonkers Jason Kens McKenzie. I speak from experience on the assessment, having got drunk with Kens at many an event over the years. Like RTCD, they have also dabbled with other formats over the years, but will remain a lot more Commodore focused, and offer up a range of free downloads, as well as physical products you can actually buy. Which of course includes many C64 cartridges, which is why I'm mentioning them here. If you're a huge C64 fan, then you no doubt know about these great guys already, but if you don't, then go check them out. I'll link both websites down in the description, as they certainly prove that there is indeed life after death for the much maligned Commodore 64 game system. Give it my best shot. I knew I could do it. And that rounds up my look at 10 amazing Commodore 64 game system facts. But which one of these fabulous facts was your favourite, or can you think of any other tantalising tidbits of trivia that I didn't include? I always love to hear the thoughts and views of my audience, so please get typing in that comment section. Before I go though, I must thank all of my loyal patrons for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible. However, I must give special thanks to the following patrons and YouTube backers in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Grady Haynes, Mitchell Valentino, Seth A. Robinson, Carl Olsen, Dos Gamer Man, Sonic Mania 999, Paul Daniel, Andrew McKay, Retro Resolution, Matt Standish, James Taylor, Trogdor the Burninator, Minz, 8-Bit Guy, Luke MC, Ben P. Stein, Tabby Kitsun, and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now. You can get access to host extra content, including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights, and much more besides. I've been the Laird, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all again for another video very soon. <laughs>